Hi all, this is Skate, and today I want to have a look at the Object 268. Now this is a tank which has been in the game for a long time. And because of that, it's one which gets, not left behind, but just pushed to the side a little bit, because you keep getting newer tank destroyers come in, and new things to play with. I've had this in my garage since 2015, and when I go back and play it, I forget how good it is. And more important, how much fun this tank can be to play. And the reasons this tank is so much fun to play is because it has that monster gun, it's ridiculously fast for a tank destroyer, and on top of that it has very good armour. We've all had some really frustrating bounces off the front of this thing, but from the same perspective, we've all penetrated this at times where we thought, that shouldn't have gone in, that shouldn't have gone in. So what I want to do for the first part of this video is focus on the armour, because I think it's very, very important on this tank. Trying to maximise the armour, take advantage of it, is key, I think. So the first key note on this tank is this is an upper casement welded to an IS-8 chassis. Now when you think IS-8, you just think easily penetrated for a heavy tank, but you don't think like that in terms of the 268. Now on paper, this thing has 187 millimeters of armor. However, in reality, it doesn't have that on the front because this is an IS-8 hull. So we know the hull on this thing on the front has 120 millimeters of armor. Only the upper casement with the gun in has 187 millimeters of armor. That is important to remember. Also, you need to take into consideration, obviously, the effective thickness via angling. Now, this is looking at the 268 from a tier 10 medium tank. Weaknesses on the tank, rangefinder, that flat plate on the left-hand side of the gun. If you're looking at the tank, it's on the right-hand side and the lower plate. If you're in a medium tank, those are the places you realistically want to aim for. If you can't get clear shots on it then, then the other places to try and aim for are the upper casement on the outer edges. But if this thing's not pointing at you directly, aim for the top areas of the hull rather than the upper casement. Because it has 120mm, not 187 you'll have more chance of it going straight in then. Because that's the thing with this tank, as soon as you turn it slightly off centre, everything is an easy pen. You'll notice on the upper casement though it's a little bit darker in places. That's why I say aim for the lower area of the plates because it's only 120 mil. You can bounce it, well you've got no chance of bouncing it when you come off the angle. However you may just get those troll or unlucky bounces off the upper casement. Now that being said if this tank is using any form of gun depression don't aim for the lower plates. Because of the angle of it it will ricochet. And in that circumstance, when gun depression is being used, then go for the upper casement. Obviously aiming as far out as possible. Now if we look at the same tank from the perspective of the 258mm of penetration from an E5, there you can see what I mean. The upper casement then was penetratable on the outer cheeks of the upper casement, but because of the angling, it was an auto ricochet on the lower plates. So in that circumstance, if gun depression is being used by this tank, and it doesn't have a lot, but when it is being used, go for the upper outer areas of the casement. If it's not being used and it's on the flat and you have some form of angle slightly away, you have more chance of penetrating by aiming for the lower plates. Because again, this is now on the flat, you can see there's some slightly shaded areas on the upper casement, but the more you use the gun depression, the lower casement or the lower hull is instantly red, but the rest on the outer areas are penable. So that's why this tank can be ridiculously frustrating, because any form of the gun depression, you can see me doing a bit of a wiggle now, that makes it really frustrating to penetrate. But, in short, if it's using gun depression, upper area, outer areas of the cheeks, if it's not using the gun depression, aim for the lower plates. As the driver, it's advantageous to know the weaknesses of your tank, obviously, because you can just assume that people are going to be trying to shoot for there, and you can try and counter for it by quickly trying to use a gun depression by putting yourself up a ridge or something to that effect. Now when you're looking at this tank from another tank destroyer's perspective, it's pretty damn easy to penetrate regardless of effective thickness. Except, again, when you're putting the gun depression on the tank and you're using the gun depression, you can see instantly the lower plates are auto bounced and this highlights the point even further, but the upper casement is an easy pen. Now to me this really highlights its playstyle or what you should be trying to do with this tank and that quite simply is go and bully the medium tanks. 
If they can't penetrate you reliably, they're going to switch to premium, then they are going to penetrate you, however, they're going to be doing much less DPM, and with your over 3000 DPM, you're going to pick them apart very, very quickly. The key to surviving that, though, is obviously making sure that they can't flank you, because once they get around your gun, you're screwed. So that's what I'm going to try and go through in the rest of this video and in the gameplay. What I have to show you is four games that are played back to back. You'll see that from the timestamp in the bottom right anyway. But quickly, let's have a look at the equipment. This is what I have on mine. If you're going to continue, I'd go with the gun lane drive. I would then go with the enhanced armor just to make it even more frustrating. Then I wouldn't go with engine accelerator. I would actually recommend going with the improved control to help traverse in case you do get flanked. And then from there, V-stabs. And then if you're going to go further, go with the enhanced tracks and then consumable delivery system. After that then, I run 22 AP, I run 6 Heat, and I run 6 HE. You can put 23 AP in, I just don't like the number being slightly different. <laughs> so, you can put more in, but yeah, I like to keep it nice round numbers. Don't ask me why, I don't actually know why, I just, yeah, prefer it. <laughs> um, provisions, pretty much the same as my always, improved combat rations, and improved fuel. And then again my standard type system with consumables. I use the multi-purpose, the repair kit, and the adrenaline. So without further ado, obviously let's get into the gameplay. As I mentioned, these four games are played back to back, but I hope they give a good example of how I aim to play the tank. Now one thing which I do think is important is if you are in a game against many other tank destroyers, you do get those games where Matchmaker loves you and puts six bloody great big tank destroyers on the enemy team. If that is the case, try and play at medium to long range for the first couple of minutes to try and preserve a little bit of your hit points. What I'm trying to do here is set up to wait till the mediums come out. Because of the way my equipment is though, this thing I don't think is very good at medium to long range. Because I don't have a gun lane drive and I don't have V-stabs. If you did manage to fit all that to the tank, it would be pretty effective. So what I'm trying to do here is damage the mediums from medium range, and then I will go in and face hug them. And when you're brawling with mediums, I think it's imperative that you stick yourself to the face of their tank. Because they can't traverse around you when you're doing that, or if they can, they do it a damn sight slower. On top of that, you know your armour is facing directly at them straight, because that's when your armour is most effective. Plus it's funny watching them stress out and panic as you're literally attached to them. Um, the other fun part is obviously if you have got things like Leos, you can go straight into the side of them, use your HE for a very high nasty damage roll against them. But you'll see what I'm trying to do is park my tank directly up against them and keep hard cover next to you always. In a turretless tank destroyer, need hard cover. And if you can't get hard cover, ram them as hard as you can to try and do some track damage. So you can see I'm trying to pry this T-62A off me, and the way to do it, I pushed forward to try and push him up the rock a little bit, and then reversed because it gave me that little bit more maneuverability. On top of that, he's now directly in front of our gun, and there's not a whole lot he can do to get away from us or circle us, so we can finish him off very quickly. And now it's just a case of going to help the team with the rest of the guys. We are winning at the moment, but... You've seen so many of these games just turn around and go the other way. I've got a nice shot on the Death Star here, but I have to wait until it aims. This thing has very good penetration, and it has very good accuracy. But if you don't let it aim, the shots go everywhere. Which is where the gun lane drive and the V-stabs would really help this tank to really reduce that aim time. And make it a bit more snapshot. Obviously, with the way my equipment is, I can't really do that without fully waiting for it to aim in. But in any other circumstance, if you do have them fitted and you're playing the tank a lot, it is definitely worth going for the gun lane drive and the V-stabs. Now, in this circumstance, the IS-7 was on very, very low health, so I turned my back to him, thinking the E-75 could deal with him. However, that T-54 had a shot on him, which means my butt is exposed. Now, that T-54 bounced off my upper casement. I'm assuming he was either going for the rangefinder, or I'm going to assume he was going for that flat bit next to the gun. If he went for the lower 
plates on this. Not the lower plates, but the lower plates I mentioned, the 120mm ones, with the angle he was at looking down on them, he should have been able to penetrate them no problem at all. Obviously, as the 268 driver, I have no complaints whatsoever with people doing that, but if you are shooting at one of these, try and remember the angling on it will make all the difference. But that sort of game gave us 4,400 damage and a first class. Now, the next game after that, we're going to play quite aggressive and go straight for B. Now, what I mentioned about the lower plates earlier, I think is important when it comes to brawling, especially the actual lower plate. And the first battle here, sorry, the first brawl I get into here is a very, very good example of how to reduce the chances of someone penetrating your lower plate. Now, things like this aren't guaranteed to stop people penetrating you. A lot of people seem to think, oh, he said if I do this, then it's guaranteed. No, it's not guaranteed. Nothing is. But things like this really do help make a difference. I'm going to aim for his lower plate, shoot his lower plate, and you can see he's aiming for my lower plate. But as I come in close, I come below his gun depression. So he can't aim for or hit my lower plate. Now, there is a chance he could have penned my upper plates or the upper casement. However, Coming in close, as you think he's about to shoot, stops him going for the big weakness on the bottom of the tank, which makes all the difference. If we didn't come in close then, you guaranteed he would have penetrated our lower plate, which means we would be 400 and something, maybe even 800 if both those shots went down to the lower plate. However, coming in close made both of them bounce, and we've saved ourselves a big chunk of our hit points. Like I said, it's not guaranteed, but little things like that can make all the difference. And again, we're trying the same thing with the T-62A. He's not looking at us. He bounces us for some reason, though. <laughs> but tanks with huge amounts of gun depression, they're a threat to you, because when you're brawling close to them, they can just point down on your lower plates and penetrate that 120 millimeters. In any other circumstance, they're really going to struggle. Like that waffle up by there. He's looking down on us. He should have penned us. Again, I'm not complaining, but because... He's a big squishy target, and because he's aiming down on us, I ignored the T-62A then, which the IS-7 was dealing with, and looked at him for a nice healthy HE round. It's a similar sort of thing with Foshes. When you're using the gun depression on them, the effective thickness goes up on the upper plates. Or the upper plates, rather. But obviously when he's pointing down a hill, he's got literally no armour, and every single tank can penetrate him. But that's where I feel, personally, the 268 has a better advantage over the Fosh. Because even when someone's pointing down on it, the upper casement's still very troll, as long as you're pointing directly at them. So unless they know where to shoot on your tank, depending what angle you're at, there's really not a lot they can do. And I think that makes all the difference. Now, I am quite exposed here. I'm going to try and circle the E75. It's not going to work, so I give up, turn around, and just face hug him. And I'm obviously going for his cheeks, and we do manage to finish him off. And what's left? Ah, just an ST-1. Age-old argument, but it's an ST-1, it's not an STI, otherwise they wouldn't have made an ST-2, just saying. But, <laughs> it is an ST-1. It's a Roman numeral one, but not an I. Well, the Roman numeral one is an I. But you don't call it the STI, it's the ST-1, just like you got an ST-2. Which is irrelevant from this video, but there we go. That game, though, again, gives us 4,467 damage. We made 24,000 credits in that one. And obviously that got us another first class. I imagine XP from capping bases made a difference in that as well. But for some reason, Matchmaker being Matchmaker has stuck me on exactly the same damn map. So can you guess what I'm going to do? Exactly the same damn thing. <laughs> hey, if it worked once, why wouldn't it work again? So I'm going for B, I'm going to pull in tight to that building again. And it's almost like deja vu looking at the last match, isn't it? I'm looking at this just expecting an IS-7 to come around. And I bet you guys, unless I said this, were going, why has he put the same replay in twice? But they're not coming around to get me this time, or the IS-7 isn't anyway. Now you'll see I'm looking around, and I'm very conscious of the fact that I know there's mediums at C, and when you look at the minimap, there's nobody on my left-hand side to cover me to even spot anything before any of the mediums come around. 
which is why I've turned this way facing this way ready, because if those mediums flow flew around to B, I'm screwed because they're already on my ass. I am next to hardcover, but it would be hard to shake them once they're fully on the butt. But, too many butts. I really should re-edit that, but I'm not gonna. But yeah, I've... <laughs> I turned ready because when you're facing them, obviously you have the biggest advantage, you're ready for them. They haven't come around that way, you could see the Leo disappearing off down there, which is why I decided to try and turn and get a good shot into the side of the Death Star while I had the opportunity to. I'm going to try and aim through the boxes here. The advantage of doing through the boxes, by the way, is they can't launch Hesh at you, or HE if they're going to. Yeah, if he was looking my direction, he could have put a H or an AP round straight down. And it would have gone through the boxes, but he can't see what he's aiming at then. So that's why I like to try and shoot through scenery, especially when you're pointing at something like a Death Star. Again, as I mentioned with the lower plate thing, it's one of those things which doesn't guarantee what I'm explaining. However, it does help and give that little bit of extra chance. Now, this is what I like. The Object 268 is quite clearly spotted us and is coming for us thinking there is a lone tank destroyer. So we're going to try and get one into this Leo quickly. We do finish him off because HE on a Leo is hysterical fun and now the OBJ is coming after us. Except we're next to hard cover so he can't fully circle us. Which gives us the advantage here because now he's had to stop and turn and face us and as soon as he does that I can park my tank on the side of him which really slows him down in terms of trying to circle us. And again, with a hard cover there, he can't do anything to circle us. So what we're gonna do is obviously get one into him, reverse back to make sure I don't bounce it off his turret, and then I'm gonna pull forward again and face him completely straight. Doing this genuinely works like clockwork. And yeah, they can traverse around you faster than what you can traverse, which is why I would recommend getting that equipment if you can to increase your traverse, just to help in that circumstance in making sure your frontal armour is always pointing at them. It makes it that little bit easier. Now with the enemy grill, you'll see I'm very low health. I'm potentially a one-shot on a huge damage roll, or I'm more than likely two. However, I'm going to rush him with HE because he's a dangerous tank destroyer, and I know I can do a massive amount of damage to him in one hit. So I'm really happy to trade off my hit points to get a huge chunk of his gone. And of course, getting that full penetrating HE shot means tons of module damage. Now, I don't think we would have beat the reload on that grill anyway, but the T-54 by here did finish us off, which means it's left up to our friendly T-62A, who is going to finish the job, and he has played a very good game. So he's got one shot in the T-54 and one shot in the grill, and that's that game done. So you can see with the grill, by the way, the one other thing I didn't mention, he, he didn't even need to aim, he just shot at me, penetrated no problem at all. So something to watch out for with other tank destroyers. But that game, even though we died, we still got a mastery and 4,800 damage, and we had just shy of 1,500 XP, which I think is not just down to... The damage also it's down to we spotted our own targets because we obviously spotted the leo the grill at the start and the obj but we obviously caught b alone which means all the xp from capturing and keeping b throughout the entire match obviously helps to contribute in terms of xp as well now this map i think is perfect for this tank you can hide the lower plates under ridges like that one on the left hand side now and you can really go up and bully the mediums now I noticed the T-62A driving off there, so I assumed he was going with the rest of the team. So I'm going to try and get on this ridge. I've never got up there, so I thought, screw it, it's worth a chance. Because there's no one here, but there was. <laughs> there was. There was a T-54 there, but we managed to ammo rack him. Which again is the wonderful part of this 152mm. It can cause some serious ammo rack damage, or module damage rather. But obviously the T-54 is dealt with. I think even if he didn't have the XP, or sorry, even if he wasn't Amorax, we still would have been able to face hug him and deal with him. Now this circumstance there, you'll notice that I wasn't fully next to hard cover, which is why I reversed towards the building, which did allow him a shot into our side, but that's the only one he got into the side of us. Now he's fully frontal onto us, and you can see... <laughs> 
I'm not sure if he was trying to wiggle to stop us penetrating him, or he was wiggling trying to look for a shot on us. But it's not uncommon to face hug a tank and just watch their turret go hell for leather while they try to find somewhere to penetrate. And that tickles me. Now we can see the grill is by himself here. The rest of his team are further forward, so you'll see I've put the HE on ready and I am going to rush him because we can get a full penetrating hit him. We got lucky to set him on fire, but we did ram him for the last of his health. Even if he did manage to get a shot onto us, I still think it's worth doing it that way. Because with the HE, you will penetrate him all day long. So yeah, all in all guys, for me, this tank, I think, is absolutely devastating when you put it on a flank and you go and push medium tanks. We've taken three nearly full health tanks out and we've did a bit more damage to that fourth one there. Granted, we got lucky with the ammo rack at the start, but I still don't think we would have had much of an issue as long as we were next to hard cover and face hugging him. And that's pretty much how I try to play this tank. Uh, on the flank, pushing the flanks. Sometimes I've gotten lucky, come around a corner and see an entire team, which you know half of them are going to penetrate you, but it's the way it goes sometimes. But that one did net us 5,930 damage and another mastery badge. Now the idea of putting a turretless tank destroyer up against medium tanks is quite, it can be a daunting thing. But it's something I don't think the Object 268 struggles with in the slightest. Its armour can stand up to them all day long. And as long as you have that cover, you've got good traverse, you can catch them quite quickly. And as long as you're hugging them, no problem whatsoever. That's how I try to play this tank anyway. I hope you've enjoyed the video, guys. I hope you found some of it useful. Um, thank you all for watching, and I will catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.